Wow, that's exciting. So when we talk so much about worship here, worship is not just a service, but it's really who we are. It's an expression of everything God is. We're expressing who he is. Romans 12 tells us, present your bodies a living sacrifice. So he wants to free us in so many ways that we can express who he is. Jesus expressed the Father in his own body when he hung on the cross. Hands extended. Every act that you see was worshiping him on the cross. You can trail it back to the things that Jesus did on the cross were acts of worship before the Lord. So if you're going through things and you may not feel like I'm not in a mood to worship him, that is one of the better times to do it. It becomes a sacrifice when we don't feel like it. It costs us something and we're engaging in it. When everything else is falling apart around you, at that point it has a value and you minister unto the Lord, then there's a dialogue he ministers back to you. There's times of refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. So anytime that we press in the Lord here, I mean, they could sing all the right songs, everything here, and we do nothing, but the congregation has to come together corporately and every part of the body connecting according to 1 Corinthians 12, that gives an expression of the Lord. So I love the fact that all of you are worshipers, you're trained to be worshipers, and when we come together, there's something about extolling the Lord, but it, it sparks and provokes one another to go after him. As some of these guys were saying, I came here and I didn't see anything that I saw one of my friends there and all of a sudden they pulled me in and then they were touched by the Holy Spirit. So we're in a great season for the stirring of the Spirit of God. Our nation is divided. Our, there's a lot of things going on in the world around us, but what a great time to lift your head from which comes your help the hills of the Lord, the presence of God, and look to Him as the author and the finisher of our faith. We will not be disappointed, but we have to learn how to do that. <clears throat> next, uh, next, next week, we're starting a new Bible class. Uh, Toby Quirk's going to be teaching that. It's called, in the book of James, taking the whole book of James, going the very exegetically through that. And this is one of the books that I, I said that I wanted to be taught here. So it's, it's very appropriate for our time, but it also teaches us self-control in our lives so that we can give this expression to the Lord and have the freedom of that. So I encourage you to be here at, uh, for that class tomorrow. And then tonight, what is tonight? Night. Night of ministry. I will be here along with some others as well. <clears throat> Years ago that the Holy Spirit, in fact, let's start speaking to, to Diane, first of all, about doing this ministering to one another prophetically and trusting God for those words to become, you know, life and spirit with them. And so it's grown from that time. Other churches come in, other places come in. And so we're, we're, just, we're just stewarding something that God has, has called us to do. We hold everything with an open hand. We don't possess anything. One of the things I was praying this morning, I said, Lord, I release everything that you've put in my, in my hands and put in my life and put in my way, I release it to you and hold it as a steward, not as an owner. Because I, everything that God has is to possess us. And though we step out in faith, but it still has to possess us before we can really move out in that. So for many, many people, they say, God, if you want me to do this, then you, you come and overwhelm me. Well, he can possess us, fill us up completely with a gifting but at some point in time, we have to step out and activate that to see it beginning to move and open from that point. And uh, this morning, many of you, because you were at camp and various other places, you came in hungry for the presence of God instead of just saying, I'm just going to set this one out today and just observe. And that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do is you're not to worship how you feel, worship how, what you think, what's going on in your life. You worship by who he is not what, who you are. And you may be in the bottom of the, of the pit, of the pit of despair, but you can worship your way out of that by recognizing who he is. So we're excited for that as well. <clears throat> I want to share with you this morning, I know it's going to be a, probably a series because I don't, I'm not, don't take time to give all of it, but I want to give you three verses of scripture that you can turn to and then the rest of it, I'll just be quoting that. So kids... I know we didn't do the, the video. Meet your teacher in the back. It's the best I could do. Thank you for guys for responding out of that as well. A 
couple of years ago, I had a dream that stayed with me for several days. You didn't know me personally. I, I normally uh, don't have a lot of dreams that I think has any sense or value with that. But this one stayed with me for several days. I was interviewed on Sid Ross program because I happened to be up there for another reason concerning this. And in the dream, there was a man that came to me and was here in the church said, I'm going to donate a million dollars <throat> to the church. But I have to see if you're ready for it. And the church has to be audited. And I thought, I can assure you in my dream, I'm having this conversation. I can assure you our books are in order. There's nothing hidden. And so do it. And he said, well, come to my office tomorrow and we'll see. So the next day in my dream, I come to his office and was out on his palatial estate far off the road. And I came through these gates that opened automatically as I came through. There was a man at the doorway and I had a briefcase full of all, all of the paperwork that I would need to, to show an audit. And the guy at the gate says, you don't need that. And I said, yeah, I do. He asked for it. He said, you do not need that. Leave it here. Where you're going, there's no paperwork. So I'm a little confused. My dream thinking, okay, I don't know what's happening here. I walk into his office. It's as far as the eye could see, it was all glass. And, and he, is, he was looking outwardly. And his, his uh, back was turned to me. And he turned around. And the glory of God was on him so strongly, I could not see his face. And he looked at me and I knew all of a sudden everything that I need to know. And I said, this isn't about money, is it? He goes, no, this is about the glory of the Lord, which is the greatest value that heaven with his son will offer you. I knew it went through the scripture in my mind, all the things that had glory connected with it. There's three levels of glory. We sang about one, I'm Shekinah glory. And I said, well, what about the audit? And he said, it's not about auditing nickels, noses, numbers, about paperwork. It's the auditing of the heart. Because you have asked the Lord for the glory of the Lord. You've caught the Father's attention. This is in my dream. And he said, he's willing to come with his glory to the level that you're ready to receive him. I knew what the verse of Scripture says, you'll not put any more on us than what we're able. There's a couple of ways that we can see that and make application to it. He said, he'll not put any more on us than what we're able to bear. So instead of saying, you're not ready and just moving on, the Holy Spirit, which is the administrator of everything Jesus said, he comes and he said, I want to prepare the vessel, prepare the house, prepare the people to have the capacity to receive what, I'm at, what you're asking for. And I knew that was dangerous words. Because when the Lord prepares you, according to Matthew, the 11th chapter, under pressure, the word biazo there, that he pushes out everything and crowds it out that doesn't belong to him. He will not allow there to be mixture or half-hearted, it was half anyway. And in the middle of that, he looked at me, he said, are you ready for this pressure. He used some other words, but I knew what he said. And when you're in the presence of the Lord, you're willing to say yes to anything. After you walk away and say, what have I done? And I said, yes, Lord, this is what I've lived my whole life for, is to see your glory and your presence over your people and for them to live in that place in that canopy of your presence. He said, then get ready. That was, uh, I think, two years ago. This is going on the second year where that happened. Recently, I heard the Lord say to me, he said, the audit has begun, and you're closer than what you thought you were. Because I'm thinking, man, I know a lot of things. I don't think we're going to pass this inspection. Jesus uses the word in the New Testament. He said to those in Jerusalem, I would have gathered you like a hen would gather the chicks, but you did not recognize... The word recognize just didn't mean take notice, but you didn't recognize or participate is the word actually. You did not recognize your visitation. And the word visitation there, we get the word episkopos, episcopal, literally means inspection. It would be like someone inspecting a house that came to inspect your house. 
that was ready for someone to inhabit it, someone to be sold or those things. You've all had those inspectors. And they look at everything. They get picky. They, they test the water pressure. They test the electrical. They test things that, that we who live in a house that are so used to that. Well, that's not a big deal. So I've lived with that hole in the wall for years. That's no big deal. And we get to where we accept and adjust ourselves to the lukewarmness or the area around us. When the, the inspector comes, he said, that's not sufficient. It may be okay with you, but not for the one who's going to come and live in this house. We know that he tells us that he's called us to be a habitation or a dwelling for his presence. And so the Holy Spirit will come and you may be sensing conviction of the Holy Spirit upon you. You may be feeling a little bit of pressure. I do. More than I ever have felt in my life. I felt pressured in the fact of not telling God what I'm able to do and not able to do. Or tell him that I'm too tired to do it. But he says, I'm in charge of the clock. Do not tell me when you're off the clock. I will give you grace for the time you need it, but you don't determine the level of grace that, that you have. I want to cause you to walk with me in such a way that you're not reactive to circumstances around you, but you'll be proactive with the things when the Holy Spirit comes. Recognizing the visitation, then how do I move in concert with him? How do I move in direct participation with him? Very much the same way in Judges where Gideon brought the people down to the water when they were getting ready to go to war. And he had thousands and God said, there's too many. God always operates in a different way than what we think. Anytime that you can figure out God, you're wrong. God doesn't make common sense. He is a spirit. He's not a human. He has a brain that thinks like we think. And Psalms tells us that. And with that, he lets us know that I want to do it in such a way that I'll be glorified. He brings them down to the water and how they, depending how they, they drank from the water, then God chose them and it was his, and it was his criteria how they were to do. And they drank, pulled water up to them, lapped like a dog. And they were saying, those are the ones I want, 300 of them. In other words, God said, I'd rather have 300 that are submitted themselves to me, learning how to drink in the way that I say, worshiping in the way that I'm calling you worship, than to have thousands who are onlookers but are not participants who haven't seen the visitation of the Lord, the inspection of the Lord. So I'm excited to believe that, here to tell you that we're really close to passing inspection. So how do you know that? I just know it in my spirit, or maybe it's just with me. But the Lord just lets us know you're close to in passing inspection and do not ask me why, do not ask me how come, and do not ask me how long because the details is up to him. Amen. And every one of us may be in a different timeline as far as spiritual timeline of what that happens with. We can prolong that season by complaining and being angry at God. Why me? Why now? How come? Or we can just praise and worship the Lord through the process and honoring him at all times and all seasons being in season and out of season. So I want to share with you something this morning concerning foundations. Everything that touches our life, even in this planet, the earth, and physically for us, relationally, and everything you find, whether it's financial, relationship with a friend, in marriage, and we'll cover a lot of those, not today, but in everything has a foundation. Now, the word foundations in Psalms 11th chapter in the verse 3, it says this. If the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? The psalmist sees that if the foundations are gone, what else does there do? You cannot build on something where there's no foundation. Amen. If you've ever had termites hit your house and then eats up the foundation, everything starts crumbling. And next thing is things that you've always taken for granted work is no longer working. Doors don't shut. Things don't work like they're supposed to. Things roll down from one end of the house to the other. You've got to look at something is wrong, not with the roof, but with the foundation. So I'll get into the days ahead that if you find chronic problems in your life relationally or even in the marriage, you have to look at it and say, what is on the foundation? I need to go back and rebuild the foundation, look and say what I need to do on this foundation but the Bible talks a lot about foundations. 
It talks about Zion being the foundation. There's foundations talked about in the book of Revelation. The last days will happen. There's 12 foundations. But then we get talks about the foundations of our life and our foundations of our relationship with the Lord. I was talking with someone recently. They don't attend church. They're not really a believer. So I asked him, I said, as we get close and we see things happening that I can show you biblically that things are happening that are fulfilling that never has been fulfilled in our in thousand years. And we're in the 6,000 year. We know that 6,000 stands for man. The seventh is no more. Seven years, that's when he, he, God rests from his labors. He said, many, means it's finished. And I said, how would you determine that if you would, when you die, that you would stand before the Lord that he would give you the right to enter into eternity with the light and the glory of the Lord and the peace of God. Or the fact separation from God. God doesn't send people to hell. They choose to go there by rejecting him. It's not about acceptance. It's rejection. A non-acceptance is rejection. If you ask someone to marry you and they said, well, I'm not saying no, but I'm not saying yes. Well, what does that mean? It means I'll let you know, which means no. So they said, you know, I'm a good person. I haven't cheated people. I try to do what's right. I try to be fair, try to work on my job in the best I can. And I said, but you know, the Bible has the criteria where that opens up. The foundation of our life is centered around, the Bible said, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Everything is connected to Jesus. John 10 said, that he is the doorway to the Father. If we try to come in any other way, any other new age idea, or in our self, uh, how good we are self, then we're separated from God. That Jesus is the doorway into eternal life. He's the foundation of every good and perfect thing. So what he says, and Psalmist said, if the foundations are destroyed, the very thing that we have faith and belief on, if they're destroyed, what do we do? We're in a time where the banking systems are very shaky. Yep. We're in a time to where communications and around things we take for granted are very shaky. It's very controllable. We're seeing the fact of uh, medical systems, you know, uh, are very shaky. And all of these things, according to Hebrews 12, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But I'm glad he didn't leave us hanging there so that the things that remain can be built upon. He will shake things off in order to build something on. So thankfully, the Holy Spirit is in charge of the inspection, in charge of our life with that. So I want us to do a quick little Bible lesson, then I'll, I'll show you connecting with that. It all began when God put man in the Garden of Eden, and he put him in a place to where he wanted him to have a choice. God is all about choices. He's not forcing us to love him. He's not forcing us to serve him. He wants to do it out of a love relationship. There are, there's religions in the world that uses fear tactics that if you don't do this and you don't follow, follow all these edicts and all of these rules, then the, the, your God, whoever you believe he is, is going to be mad at you and you're going to pay the price for it. God wants us to come to him out of a relationship that's very loving and very kind. In fact, the Bible describes God. God is love. The very nature of his God is to love the world so much he gave the first gift and offering that destroyed the works of the devil that was against us through his own son. So he put it in the garden and he said to them, here is my paradise. Here's the relationship. Here's how I want to meet with you and commune with you. I want to commune with you in this garden-like environment. I'm going to come down every day and we're going to have some communication and talking. You'll find I get into the marriage part of it. One of the issues that destroys more marriages is there's no one talking. Amen. They're afraid to discuss something because it won't. What's the use of talking? We don't say anything. We don't communicate. How would it be to have a relationship with God and say, God, we're not talking. I'm just going to forget it ever happened and move on. It doesn't happen that way. You've got to go back and repent so I can be changed and moved into that. In the same way, the foundations of life, when he tells us the fact that the Put you in this place, this presence of God. And I want, there's choices there. There's a tree of life that you can eat every day, all the time. Anything you want in this garden belongs to you. But I'm putting a boundary around something. And this boundary around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which sounds really good. Good, the word is Gnosticism, which means to figure out God with your brain, your rationality. 
I am putting this, this tree of knowledge of good and evil there. And I want you to know that it's off limits to me. If you eat this, you will surely die. Meaning the fact that death meaning separation from God. Not a physical death, but an eternal thing. And so they lived that way until the time came that there was an alternative thought introduced in the garden which the serpent came and said to them, that time scholars believe the serpents walked on his hind legs, spoke to her, says, God knows that if you eat of this tree, you will not die. He first of all puts doubt and unbelief that God will, God's not telling the truth. And he comes and introduces something at a tree that says it won't happen the way God said. They ate of the tree, the glory of God, that place where he communicates with them is lost. Communication between God and man is broken forever. They have to leave that place, that environment. Now in Isaiah, the 11th chapter, verse 1 and 2, there's a Messianic prophecy that was given concerning Jesus or Messiah, which they didn't know was Jesus then, Messiah was to come. And he said, there shall come forth a branch, this is Isaiah prophesying, forth a branch from the stem of Jesse, which we know is David's father, King David, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge of the fear of the Lord. Notice that the tree in the garden, it was all, the, the boundary was set around the knowledge of good and evil. Here the Messianic prophecy is, there's going to be a branch, another tree that's going to grow up out that God has set in order from the foundation of the world. And it's going to come out of the lineage of one that I recognize Davidic as a worshiper, one who's willing to give himself to God. And he's out of the stem of Jesse, the lineage, which we know goes all the way up thousands of years, hundreds and thousands, at least a hundred, several hundred years into the line, line of Christ. And he says to them, and this one, that the spirit of knowledge... You want a knowledge? It's fine. But don't get it from a tree that has boundaries off limits. Don't go to the world and find, trying to get knowledge of understanding what the trending and latest thing in the world so you can be cool. That's the tree of the knowledge of evil, good and evil. But God said, I will give you that you can eat from this tree of the knowledge of the Spirit of God. I will fill you with the understanding how God sees it, not how the world sees it. Then you find the same thing in Jeremiah 33. And he said, I'm going to bring a branch out of or a stem, a, a root out of a dry ground, and it shall come forth and it'll be the one who, who delivers Israel from it. It's interesting that it all began with a tree. Isaiah comes along and prophesies, I'm going to bring this deliverer out of a tree. And yet according to Galatians, the third chapter, it says that, Cursed is everyone who does what? Hangs on a tree. God used the tree to reconcile man back to himself. It started with a tree and it ended with the tree, the cross. And as Jesus was hanging there and he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. What Adam, the first Adam did that lost communication and separation from God, the second Adam, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 46 and 47 in there, was the one to restore communication back with the Father. And it came to the point at this tree. And we know that Paul says like this, I am crucified with Christ. I'm coming back to this truth. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not me who wants to live. It's no longer my will, but his will who lives in me. Now, it's not the idea that God wants to keep us from having fun, but he said, there's things that will kill you that I've put boundaries around. Just in the Garden of Eden, it is about choices. He leaves it up to us. Choose this day whom you'll serve. Amen. He brings us back to that tree, now the tree of the cross. Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They don't want they do. And the very last thing that happens was he's forgiving this thief on the cross who didn't join a church, have water baptism, did not speak in tongues, but he said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. <sighs> That'll mess with your theology right then. So what was the one thing that this thief had? He had a connection with the Son of God. Jesus is the doorway. He is the one who came to the tree 
and said, it started with a tree of the Garden of Eden, was rejected out of that. I come and I restore my relationship back to you with this tree. And now you have the power of resurrection operating in you to destroy everything that Jesus overcame in the Garden of Eden and in the Garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers come in to, came in to take Jesus. And he said it earlier in John 14, the thief, the prince of this world comes and he's not going to find anything in me. Here's the key. There are things in us that resonate with this world and connects with this world that causes us to be under the influence and causes us to be under the, the, the things that produce fruit in this world. Jesus said, the prince of this world comes, he's going to test me, but he will find nothing in me that will resemble them or resemble what they're saying and doing. There's a different spirit. When Jesus on the cross, he came to give us a different spirit than the spirit of this world. So my question to you today, if you're, if you're dealing with things that are chronic again and again and again, over and over and over, same things, you're fighting the devil. If your conversations all the time about what the devil's doing and you don't discern what the Lord's doing, that means we're more sensitive to the kingdom of darkness than we are the kingdom of light. He wants us to fall so much in love with him that we know what he's doing. And to trust him so much so that if you see something of darkness flies up and says, oh, you. But the kingdom of God. Greater is he that lives within us, speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, than he that's in this world. So we draw from the internal part of the presence of God. And he's built a foundation inside of us that we can say, because Jesus over overcame I am overcoming right now and he's put a foundation in my house that will stand firm and I'll not have to worry about the spirit of the termite of this world coming and trying to eat up the foundation. Part of the foundation that, that for the Christian life we experienced this morning is to worship the Lord thy God with all of your heart, your mind, and strength. That's the foundation. And if we're one who, oh, thank you, Lord, now and then, but it has to be a lifestyle that every day that you're thanking the Lord, have a thankful and grateful heart. You strengthen the foundation that the enemy cannot come and build something on the foundation. He'll come with a squatter's rights to say, you know, I've been here a while, I'm going to squat, I'm going to take over. No, you, you have no right. You're trespassing. But get off because of the blood of Jesus. All right, look with me. Because sin began at the tree, deliverance comes with the tree. Turn with me, Hebrews, the first chapter in verse 3. It's probably all I'm going to be able to get to today. I love these testimonies. These testimonies have prophetic impartation. They're saying something to us, not just interesting to hear. They're imparting something to us, saying we're a habitation of God as a house of worship. Now, Hebrews, the first chapter... Pick it up in verse 3. Speaking of Jesus, who in the last days, he's resurrected, came through the tree, through the cross. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law. Galatians 3 says, we're bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. And so now we're seated with him in heavenly places. If you have invited Jesus into your heart and life and let him begin to take over and help you make choices that resemble him. The last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed, he's appointed him as, as the doorway, the heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. Now, the worlds have foundations. Everything in this world, and you can look at it scientifically, is held together by a frequency or a gravitational pull. It's a meridian, there's an electrical pull. That's why if you just take your shoes off and go barefooted out on the ground, you feel good. You feel better. It's because there is an electrical pull from the earth. That's not a new age thing. It is a scientific, it's a real thing. You may get worms or something on, from your feet, but nonetheless, you'll feel a little better from the other. It's just like having, having some sun. He's spoken to us by a son who's appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. He made the worlds through his son who being the brightness, the glory, the brightness of his glory and the express image, the expression 
of the Father. Jesus said, told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he's t- teaching us and training us. When you respond and react as Jesus did, you're expressing, you're showing forth as an ambassador, Jesus as in the Father. He said, me and the Father are one. All right, here's the kicker. He's express image of the person and upholding all things by the word of his power, which we by himself purged our sins. And he sets it down now at the right hand of the majesty on high. A lot of us quote this verse of scripture and says that he has upholded all things by the power of his word. How many of ever heard that translation? It doesn't say that. Totally different. He upholds all things. The word upholds there is a really strong Greek word, anago, which literally means we get the word energy from. He upholds everything by the energy. Now, that's not, please don't go into new age thinking and all this stuff and get you crystals and this kind of garbage. There is the presence of God, the radiation of God, if you will. He that created the sun, that the radi- radiation is the, is the most powerful thing in the whole world, the sun right there. You see it up close, you can see these solar flares, radiation. The God who made the sun is more radiant than the sun. So he said, he upholds all things by the word of his power. No. He upholds all things by the power of his word. Is that right? No. He upholds all things with the word of his power. And the word is, there is the word rhema, which is the word saying. But upholding means it's a, not a static holding up as if I was holding a house foundation and it never moves. But it is the word to move towards a destiny. So he's saying, I'm upholding, but I'm always moving in a direction. And I'm moving at the saying or the saying word or the rhema of God, which is present tense. As you hear the Lord presently, then you're moving in the direction that he's called you to be. And he's upholding you all the way through this direction until you get to the appointed time of your destiny. So in other words, God is not about static. He's continually moving from glory to glory to glory. So when he uses this word, he upholds all things by not by a word he said, said in the past and holds it like an anchor would hold it. But by his saying that he's moving you and I by a word he said over us, moving us towards a destiny that will not just be stuck in one place, but we're moving towards a place for the glory of the Lord. It's nice to know that we're being held together, upholding that by a mobile, we're mobile. Not like a mobile home has a foundation, but it's movable. Hard, house is hard to move from that point. He's coming to inspect the foundation. For what reason? Because we're going somewhere in the Spirit of God. He's taking us into His presence in a level like we've never gone before. And He's training us how to drink from Him, how to worship from Him. So that when we come before His presence, we're, we're not, we're not going to think, I don't know what to do. This isn't the protocol. This seems really strange. Because all my background has been, you sit in church, you look at some statues, we don't have any stained glass here, we don't have a steeple here, and so I'm just this unfamiliar. The Holy Spirit will train us that the protocol of the heavenlies is that when you come before Him, you bow, you worship, you extend all the kids we're saying this morning, you worship the Lord fully. Not worshiping until there's a message The early church didn't revolve around a message. They came to worship the Lord, and then they had the Torah read to them, and that was it. So the presence of God, the service meant we came to meet around his presence, not meet around a celebrity speaker, not meeting around a person and hope they had a good message to inspire me, but it was really to to meet with him, rally around him, because in his presence there's fullness of joy. So one of the counterfeits of this is to create church celebrities and church people in such a way of these, these well-known people that they can say and do anything that's not even biblical. And people say, wow, that's great. I've never heard such a thing. In the last days, the Bible said that many will fall off and deceive and be deceived. We're not deceived if we hold the Word of God inside of us and we understand that His presence 
will guide and direct us. But when we lose the sense of the presence of God, it's easy to believe anything. And how, how come that maybe Buddha's got the right thing or there's, you know, the Indians, they have six million gods. Or, or what about the Muslims? And what about the Hindus? And all of these, all of these, the, there are people that had set themselves up, Buddha, God, and all this, the six million, most of them never lived anyway. It's just a statue. Jesus came to live among us, die among us, seal the deal with what Adam failed. He said, I've came to restore the relationship. And now you have the right to communicate with the Father. And what's more, he came to dwell inside of you. And you carry the power and the host of the heavenlies so that he, what he overcame, now you have the power to overcome. Here's what I'd love for everybody in this church to know. Is to know that you have inside of you the ability to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Not to call me. I mean, I'll be happy to pray with you. What if we come into a time when church is outlawed? Because they say we're hate, we're, we have hate speech. When we're put in a situation, and this just recently happened. A pastor was saying homosexuality is wrong. I can show you several places in Scripture from the New Testament all the way into the uh, Old Testament into the New Testament, and they would consider that hate speech. Shut you down. But if I've been able as a, as a leader to instill inside of you a habitation, a house of God, presence of the Lord, wherever you go and wherever you are, there's church. Does that mean we should never come together? No, not at all. Iron sharpens iron in the presence of the Lord that we have here together, touching one another, feeling and sensing what's going on in the room is greater than anything you could sense at home. Don't settle for that. Don't settle for just the, the living room. Settle for his room. So in that place of his presence, he's saying that present tense, I am moving at this very moment, taking you somewhere, and you are the express image of the Father that has a prophetic voice to speak back to anything that resists you from making it where God's taking you. All right. Let me just finish up with this. Colossians 1, verse 17. Speaking of Jesus, he is before all things. The original says before the foundation of the world. He is before all things. He's before your job. He's before what we do. He's before every relationship. He is before all things. Whatever it is, if it's a thing, he's before it. He comes ahead of it. He's before all things, and in him, all things are held together. The same word, are held together by the energy. I know that's a kind of a bad word, but the frequency is still a bad word. By the voice, there's one we can handle. By the voice of the Lord God is held together. Someone's in trouble with that. Well, Psalms 29 says, the voice of the Lord is upon the water. How crazy does that sound to, some, to someone who doesn't believe? The voice of the Lord caused the hinds to calve. The voice of the Lord, I mean, God's up there to keep speaking, so it'll happen. He said it before time began. So everyone that comes in, every, every deer, which is a hind, every deer that comes in, he created them. His word, what it said years ago, has created them that they will give, give birth now. Whatever he said then is happening now in present tense. What he said before the foundation of the world is now moving 2023 in our time, in our season, and the word is not any less potent than it is right now, but we still come up to that continual thing that what are you going to do with your garden? What will you do in the choice of your life in the garden there? That Bible says that every person will have an opportunity to receive Christ or reject him. What are we doing with the garden of our life? We're going to have communication with the Father or say, I don't need that. I have my intellectual, I have my degrees, I have all of these things, and it's self deceiving. Because who created knowledge was God. And knowledge without God is knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge that has God in the center of it is the knowledge of the holy and his presence. How much more we see educations moving away from a foundation in creation, a foundation that God is holy, a foundation means that he is above all things. We're moving more and more to where education is your own self-judge, 
that you can think whatever you want to, whatever you believe about yourself, that's okay. That's who you are. You have the right to remake yourself. See how that works in eternity. Because when God opens, according to Psalms 139, he opens his books and he says, I, I numbered all of your members there. And you come in as an it or a he or a him or whatever. And he said, right here, according to my book says, you were born exactly like I wanted you. You are a him, but you chose this. In other words, you rejected my creation. You rejected who I am. And you formed and fashioned yourself that you became a God to your own self. And the Bible said you're not sure worship any other gods. That's not just statues. That can be our own self-idolatry. And we miss God. So we're in a war oh, in our world, in our nation, that's very subliminal. It's not just about tanks and guns and bullets, but it's for the mind of Christ. It's for a renewing presence of the Lord in our life, which is, sustains us through eternity and gives us that opportunity. And we stand before him and he says, you've chosen the tree of life instead of the tree of the knowledge of your culture, your lifetime, and all of that. Yeah. God had planned everything before the foundation of the world. He actually did. Isaiah 46 said, God knows the end from the beginning. He knew where it would end up, but he still gives us a choice to step into that. One last thought and I'm done. Luke 6, Jesus uses an interesting parable. Luke 6 and verse 47, 48. Jesus compares two foundations. And he's explaining something to his disciples and those who are around him. He said... There's one foundation that they made on sand. You could, I'm paraphrasing, you could put it up real quick. There was no preparation because all above every visual thing, all above what looks above the ground. It's all about looks. We can have a church today in the world that it's all about looks. It's all about perception. It's all about optics. And he said, when the rains come, the floods came, the wind came, it destroyed the building because it wasn't what was above ground, it was what wasn't below ground, the foundation. That was the audit I heard the Lord say, I've come to inspect. And he starts at the very foundation of life, starts at the very beginning of time. What have you done with my son, Jesus? I sent him to you. Jesus goes on to another, the other contrast with that. The other foundation was put on the rock. It was rock bed. Harder to work with, harder to build anything on that, but it was anchored. So notice it was the exact same wind, exact same flood, exact same problems came, and the house stood still. So we know it to have longevity in marriage, longevity in life, longevity where God is favoring and giving honor to us in that. It looks at the foundation we're on. What are we building that foundation? The book I wrote years ago on Power of Blessing literally that. It's creating a foundation or a culture, if you will, in our homes and lives and family. But if we have a foundation to where that we're being negative, talking evil one against the other, having an opinion about everything that, that God is in charge of, I wouldn't do it like that. How come they do that? Judging people, making statements that aren't God, then we're creating on top of the foundation that God placed on us something that's very unstable. And the enemy knows if we've ever started building something on a foundation that God didn't place there, it gives him a right to coexist there. It's called a mixture. Stand with me if you would. Father, we believe you today that you are the foundation through your son, Jesus. As we get into the end of the age, into where eternity is, I pray over every person in this room that the foundation is not just in the knowledge of, of this world, but it's the knowledge of the Son of God, the knowledge of the Holy. Lead and guide us not into temptation, as you said we should pray. One way to put that is lead us away from boundaries that you have set. You've set boundaries for the marriage. That you can't have people going sexual, immoral things outside of the marriage. He's put boundaries even around our finances. That if we honor the Lord with 
the substance he's given us that the enemy can't come and steal it. So the boundaries aren't just really to keep us out, but it's boundaries that he says, I'll protect what is also I've given you. I want the ministry team to come forward if you would. There's people going to be coming this morning for various things. Maybe you felt like you've got a battle going on. There's a squatter setting on your foundation that's subverted against you. There'll be people that'll be here to pray for you. You may just feel like I need some direction. I feel like I'm just wandering around, ship without an anchor. And there'll be people coming for that. But I particularly want to give an opportunity as I feel the tug of the Holy Spirit. If you've never received Jesus Christ, the Lord of your life, that doesn't mean just believe in Him, but I believe Him. Believe Him so much that I'm inviting Him into my spiritual well-being, my life eternally. The Bible says, if I would confess Him with my mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe that God raised Him from the dead, I'll be saved. The word saved is sozo, saved, delivered, healed. Every, every favor, every presence, every issue that God has wants to give you is held together in His Son. If you've never done that, while other people are coming, just come to anyone here and they'll pray with you and they'll lead you through the gate, Jesus. And you can settle eternal to that. So Father, I pray over all the things that have been done here today. I thank you for the youth, Lord, that are carriers of your glory and your presence. I pray that that fire, Lord, would continue to be stimulated by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We pray over anyone today, oh God, you search the heart, you know the mind, the spirit within us, that anyone that's not ready to meet face to face with you, God, that you would lead them, draw them, love them enough that they have to make the choice to come. I just pray over anyone that's dealing with sickness and disease. Jesus settled it on the cross. Every sickness and every disease was nailed to the cross. It was finalized there. It's the last tree you'll ever have to deal with. The last tree that you'll have to fight the devil over. Jesus settled it once and for all. Lord, I bless this house. God, may we pass the audit. May we glorify you in everything.